welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Uh, this year, after a long break, we had another installment of the Bioinformatics contest. And today we'll be discussing the final round problems from the contest. And to do that, I'm joined by uh, Matt Holt. Welcome, Matt. Hi. And uh, Maxim Kowalchuk. Welcome, Maxim. Hi. Oh, and I, I should introduce you, right? So uh, Matt is the second prize winner and Max is the first prize winner uh, this year. So congrats on the, on the great performance. And I'm guessing that a lot of people are wondering how they can develop, how they can learn to solve these types of problems and how you guys came to be able to do this. Could you talk about your background and what kind of training do you think allowed you to uh, perform so well um, this year? And Matt, let's start with you. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I'm Matt Holt. My, um, I guess, road to this, to this point in my life is I, I went to um, both undergrad and grad school in computer science. And uh, it wasn't really until grad school that I started to get into uh, more genetics related things. So my, my advisor at the time was studying mouse genetics. So I kind of started to learn how to apply the skills I had learned up to that point to the field of genetics. Um, more recently, I am now working at a clinical lab in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and since we're a clinical lab, of course, we're doing human genetics. So pretty much everything I've been doing for the past five-ish years has been um, focused on rare disease in humans. So uh, a lot of the skills are, are, of course, computer science related and algorithms and all those kind of fun things. But uh, it's just the place I'm applying them right now is uh, human genetics. So that's kind of the, the short answer of how I got to where I am. Cool. And do you find that your computer science education helps you in your day-to-day -day job or is it just for the contest? Yeah. Uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of really hard problems in genetics. Um, part, part of that's just the fact that the human genome is, is huge, right? It's like 3 billion base pairs. And the way we gather data to do any sort of analysis on that requires really efficient methods to do any sort of analysis just because the data is so big. So, uh, you know, I'm obviously not tapping into deep wells of algorithmic knowledge every day, but, uh, it, you know, when I get to it, it's really fun and, uh, certainly comes up fairly frequently. Cool. And uh, Max, what about you? Uh, I started programming in the school uh, and continue it in the university. So now I'm third year student uh, in computer science. Uh, basically, I do a lot of competitive programming, but from like last two years, I switch into more optimizational problems. Uh, those are more like when you doesn't have exact solution, which is typical for bioinformatics and some other uh, fields. Yeah, and I find these problems more enjoyable because in competitive programming you like have usually have five hours, hours or less. Uh, for these problems, you sometimes have week, sometimes have day, sometimes you can have like several years in case it's something, some scientific project. Uh, and it's way more interesting for me. And do, do you have a general interest in bioinformatics or is it just for, for, for the sake of contest? Uh, I think it both. Uh, so basically I am but like very competitive so if i see some possibility to participate in contests so it's like probably 100 percent uh, that i will participate even if i like have exams or something and uh, but nonetheless like uh, about a year ago i saw some courses on coursera uh, about bioinformatics and i take them just for interest. Cool. And uh, one other question I want to ask you guys before we move to discussing the the problems themselves is um, 
So, so the way uh, for our listeners who don't know, um, the way the contest is structured is that there are two rounds, the qualification round, which we won't be discussing today. Uh, this year, I think it was pretty easy. And that lasted for one week. And then there is the final round, which lasts for one, uh, one full day for 24 hours. And so every time w when I participate, I struggle with this decision, how to allocate time, how much sleep do I get, right? So there is the uh, tension between getting a good night's sleep and being rested the next day and tackling more problems versus just getting more raw time to do stuff and, and get very little sleep. So I'm curious how, how you approach this. Yeah, so for me at least, the contest starts, this year it started at 8 a.m. my time. So I basically had a full day and then it was towards the end of the contest where, you know, I, all the energy's drained for me and I just want to go to sleep. Um, I think, let's see, I got, I got a good 30-minute power nap right in the middle of, of that, about 3 a.m. for me. Um, while I was waiting for something to run, I just said, all right, I'm going to go to sleep while this runs. And, uh, you know, the time management, it's a, it's a funny aspect because like, you know, I, I don't sleep much during the contest. I had that one nap and that was it. But the rest of it's just kind of trying to figure out which problem you think you can get the most points on for your effort. Um, sometimes, honestly, I'll go look at the scoreboard to see who's, who's, finished out certain problems and if i see a bunch of people have finished problem four it's like okay i can do that one i'm going to go see what it is and take and check it out so there's kind of a, a weird almost game theory aspect to all of this where, where you're looking at how well others are doing in certain areas and trying to see if that translates into something you can do as well yeah for sure although maybe this year it didn't matter as much because um at least you, both of you i think you solved all all of the problems maybe not for the full score but pretty much you did everything so maybe it didn't matter that much in which order yeah there was only i think the, there was the one problem that had a kind of open-ended scoring system but all the other ones seemed to have an exact answer uh, it was just seeing if you could find it did you stay up until 8 a.m next day i did and then they they had the actual um They had like a live stream going on. So I stayed up a little bit longer just to say hey to the live stream. And then I, I passed out for a few hours after that. <laughs> I don't know if you had a similar experience, Max, but that, that was basically what I did. Uh, yes. Well, as for me, first about order of the problems, I think there is uh, one trick that if you start like with harder problem uh, and you doesn't solve it, At the beginning, while you're solving other problems, you somewhere inside your mind solve this the first problem, which is the most hard. So I prefer to at least read uh, and spend like at least 15 minutes uh, for all problems, and uh, then we'll see uh, which one I should work. Because uh, usually uh, to solve the problem for the full score or for the max feasible score, I test like two or three uh, different solutions. And uh, if you test the first solution near the end of the round, it's, uh, you probably wouldn't have time to come up with second and third one. Yeah, and about the time management. So I basically, while I'm a student, I don't uh have all that much like uh active life and i can like allocate uh several days for the contest so i uh, sleep a lot before the contest starts and uh i can do anything i don't do anything after contest ends because i i know that i will be tired a lot and uh, uh about sleeping during the contest Actually, I plan to not sleep at all, but somewhere at the middle, I felt that I just can't. I like almost dying, but so I sleep for one hour. But the that's all. Maybe also half a hour for like eat a food, eat some food or something. But no, 
everything every, every possible second because I remember the last submission was half a half before the end of the contest. So it's, it really matters for me. I am jealous of uh, the ability to get that sleep beforehand. I got, I got kids at home and uh, that doesn't quite uh, pan out <laughs> for me. Yeah. All right. Um, so now let's get into the problems. And the first problem is genotype imputation. And uh, that's where you get, so as your input, you get uh, binary strings, right? So uh, you have basically a set of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which have just two alleles. Um, and so you get the, um, the population for which you know the genotypes and so for, for those individuals who get two binary strings, which are the uh, uh, two haplotypes for that individual. And, um, and then you have a bunch of unknown or partially known genotypes where um, first you have just one binary string and some of the you know binary digits are replaced with question marks, which means you don't know the allele at that locus and, and your uh, goal is to guess correctly um, the unknown alleles and one thing I didn't mention is that when you get uh, partially known genotypes uh, they're not no longer binary strings right they're uh, sort of ternary strings because you you get the count of alleles which could be zero one or two um, and so, yeah, the, the, the naive approach is just to look for the known, uh, genotypes, which are most similar to the, to the partially known ones, right? Uh, but then the question is, um, how large of a context you take into account, right? So if you have a question mark in the partially known genotype, you can take a window of like one nucleotide or two or three and look for known genotypes that are most similar in that window. So yeah, I initially did something very similar to that naive approach that you were talking about. Uh, I think I even took it one step further back, which was I just picked the two haplotype combinations that got me closest to the, uh, the observations and just said, all right, whatever that adds up to is the answer, which is not very good uh, <laughs> uh, because it doesn't factor into lots, you know, lots of things like recombination and just variation within populations and things like that. Uh, but that was, that was kind of my initial, my kind of first pass at it as uh, you know, Max was talking about the different versions of things. But the problem itself, uh, you know, it's very well studied, I think, in bioinformatics. There's a lot of reasons people want to impute things, whether that's just we have an array that's, you know, it's not very, uh, it doesn't have a lot of variance on it. So you, you want to kind of figure out what might be in between or, uh, you know, any sort of low resolution test like that imputation becomes, becomes critical. Um, as, as for your question of how I ultimately did it, uh, I, I actually took a kind of machine learning approach to this one. This was a, uh, I didn't actually think it would work, but it kind of panned out pretty well, to be honest, um, where, where I basically just started combining those, those haplotypes into kind of a training set, if you will. And then uh, once I had that training set built up, I would just try to predict what the whether it was a zero, one, or two for all the ones that were were missing, and yeah, the window definitely mattered. I, I think I initially only used like five observations around, but as I increased that, the uh, the score went up. Whether the correctness went up or not, I'm not sure, but the the score at least went up. So <laughs> I'm assuming the uh, correctness did as well. And yeah, I don't remember where I ended up at. I, I think I got up to at least sixty three ish observations around, but that that varies heavily from problem set to problem set because some of them had more observations than others. So 
that's kind of how I went about it. So when you say you combined um, these into a training set, but how? what was your model like? How did you actually went from the training set to the predictions? Yeah, I mean, the the models I just used, like easy ones that you can implement in Python from SK Learn. So random forest was in there. I eventually switched to gradient boosting because it got me better answers. Uh, it was a bit slower, but it but it was better in terms of the actual results. Oh, that that is so cool! It it never never actually occurred to me to use a, a machine learning library. It's one of those, you you know, it's one of those weird problems that I don't think machine learning is a typical solution here. But I didn't know how to implement an imputation package from scratch or even how to use the ones that are available just because I haven't done it before. So uh, I basically said, how would I take a situation where I'm trying to predict something? Well, that's kind of what machine learning does is it makes predictions. So <laughs> that's that's kind of how I got to that that solution. I should, I should remember this idea for the, for the next contest. <laughs> Um, and by the way, we, we should mention, I'm looking at the scoreboard right now, and I'll be, give a bit of background. So the problem number one is one of those sort of harder problems where no one, um, no one and for no problem made a like a full score. And I think not even close. Max got the closest, right, for that one? Except one test case. I think on one test case, you have better score. Yeah, I think Max had the high score, and then I had the second overall, and then, I'm, and then it kind of fell out from there. My point is that the, the highest score, so for example, if the maximum is 150 um, points, then the, for, for example, the, for the very first test case, the maximum is like 116 out of 150, or yeah. um, for, for the third, um, third sub problem, it's 181 out of 250. So it's not even like 10% difference from the top, from the full score, but it's, um, there's a lot of room for improvement, <laughs> let's say. Um, and so did you guys think that this was the hardest one? Uh, I mean, in terms of scoring, it clearly was because no one got close to getting the maximum points. Uh, in terms of whether it's the hardest problem, period, uh, I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to say. I think it's the most memorable for me, but if it's the most hard, uh, I don't think. Is this the one you were working on late in the night, so to speak? This was the last one I was working on. Yes, yes, it's the last one. Well, was that also the one where you were, the two of you were competing uh, the hardest on? Like the pretty much determine the outcome because uh, you had a very close, right? You have very close scores. Um, uh, I know that's the one I was working on at the end of the night because I thought I could squeeze more points out of it. Yeah, there is a lot of potential there, right? In terms yeah. of the points. Yes. Uh, so Max, what was your uh, what was your approach and what were your thoughts? So basically, I have like two approaches that were not good enough and uh, like three hours before the end of the contest i done all four other problems and uh, come back to this one and <clears throat> it was hard to come up with something so i have like one stupid idea that work out in the end but so first uh, we have like n pairs and i made like n square pairs so this like simply increases the amount of data and because it's like combining haplo and different haplotypes it's like you have uh, n, n parents and you have n square child so it should be okay and the second the prediction so basically uh, i predict on based on one side so you talk about that you take some window maybe it's like 63 sites, but I use only one and I brute force all, all the clone sites and I choose one that is that gives the best prediction on the test case, on the test data, so this N square uh, haplotypes. And yeah, just choose one. And when you have like one predictor, you have uh, three possible 
values for uh, for the predictor and for the uh, one that you predict. And uh, this makes like three by three metrics and then just uh, choose maximum value from uh, each line or from each uh, column. And that basically is a prediction. So for the particular uh, site. Right, so for every site you look for another single site which will work as a predictor uh yes yeah that that is also like a very cool idea that didn't occur to me <laughs> i'm a little surprised that that worked that's cool yes i'm also very surprised because it it doesn't <laughs> it shouldn't work because it's like only one site how, how yeah. can it work but i don't know i i haven't other options in the end so i just implemented it yeah but it's a, like again like in in the spirit of machine learning, it's a very data oriented way because I, I the approaches I tried were just based on my a priori, you know, thoughts like what would be a good predictor versus both of your solutions. They use this really as a as a training set. Uh, yes, that's very cool. The next problem is called causative mutation. And so here you have a haploid version and a diploid version. So we'll start with the haploid version. In the haploid version, you get a bunch of um, haplotypes and a marker, whether it's a positive or negative for some trait. And your goal is to figure out which locus is responsible for that trait and you don't need to determine it exactly you can provide an interval within which you believe the locus lies if you are correct then you get a number of points inversely proportional to the size of the interval so the the larger interval you give the more uncertain your prediction is the uh, fewer points you get but if you are wrong, if the causal locus is outside of the interval, you get zero, of course. What were your approaches here? Uh, so basically, this problem has limited number of attempts uh, because like, you can set, try to send intervals equal to uh, of size one for the, each test case and like send a lot of these uh, attempts. Uh, and get full score without solving the problem. But the interesting thing is that you can base uh, the biggest, like the size of the length of the input data is about uh, one maximum length is about 1,000. Uh, and you have uh, 10 attempts for each test case. Uh, so basically, you can do binary research on this uh, uh, on the lens, and uh, <clears throat> without uh, writing any code, just doesn't think and just do binary search, and that's all. Uh, but uh, I also try to a little bit opt optimize this because it also take a lot of time to every time update the intervals and send. Uh, uh, attempt again and wait for the scoring. So basically, what I did, if we so if we have like two strings and we know that uh, one have a marker marker of some disease and other one doesn't, uh, and they have some interval that is the same uh, that have all the same. Uh, letters a c g t uh, this means that this interval probably doesn't uh, have mutation for the disease because like they are the this interval is the same for both healthy and uh, uh, ill uh, genome uh, but it's not exactly true so first. I take only long uh, intervals that are the same because it, if it's like one side and the uh, other letters that near this side are different, 
it doesn't say, say anything because it's uh, probability that uh, the two sides are the same one force. So I take only long enough uh, intervals. And the second, I make some thresholds. So uh, there should be enough uh, in, uh, such intervals that cover some sites. So if some site is covered by like 20 intervals, it's probably not, uh, doesn't have marker for the disease. And if like zero or only two or three, uh intervals cover some site it then probably it's the answer but uh it turned out that it's not uh work uh very well on all test cases so i can say that half of test cases it gives a very accurate solution but for the other half test cases i still use a lot of bin search yeah, I, I remember um, that like I implemented some kind of informational theoretical solution. Like I, I calculated like a mutual information between the traits and the um, and the various um, alleles at, at the loci and looked for for the maximum one. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes I. Uh, I, I did have to to resort to binary search, but I'm I'm looking at the scoreboard now, and I don't have the full score for that problem. So I don't remember if if I just was lazy enough to do binary search, or um, it didn't work. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, Matt, what were your what were your thoughts? Yeah, so this is you know this problem, much like the last one, is a very classic bioinformatics problem. Um, you know. I have this set of patients who are sick, this set of controls who are not sick, find the thing that is making the sick patient sick, right? Um, and of course, depending on the resolution of your test, you again might not have the actual variant or change that, that's causing them to be sick even in your, in your test, which is where this um, kind of imprecision comes into this problem. Um, but again, despite the fact that this is a very classic problem, this is not something I've particularly done before. So uh, this, this is another area where I actually fell back on machine learning. This is the, this is the second one. This is the last one where I fell back on machine learning to do this. Um, but, but I basically said, you know, take, take another window, right? So take five of these observations we have and see how well those five will predict whether the patient is sick or not and train the model, see how well it does, and you actually can plot it over the whole length of your, your genome, which is the sequence that they give you. And it turns out that that's really good at generating a peak, um, which is just, it's kind of what you would do in a GWAS type thing, right, where you're, you're doing this genome-wide association of which thing is, is causing my disease. So you, you can plot it, you see a peak, and uh, I think actually for every answer, that got me to the ballpark. And then it was just a matter of shifting left or right a little bit to, to get the exact answer right, almost in like a, it was very binary in that way, kind of like what Max said, um, only instead of zoning in, I was zoning out a little bit because it was slightly to the right or left of where I actually uh, had pinpointed from my initial solution. Mm hmm cool. Yeah, that, that part was a little unfun. <laughs> the little manual twiddling of the uh, the result I got. I hope they don't do something like that again. <laughs> well, it, it, it kind of was on you, right? That you didn't, you, your, your solution actually like, it sounds like no solution was good enough to produce the correct answer by its own. I think it's also, th that reflects biology too, right? Yeah. A lot of people will do these, these GWAS studies and they'll get locus whatever matches my patient but that's not usually the actual answer. There's usually, it's something around there that is the thing they're looking for. And there's usually follow-up studies to figure out what exactly that is. So it, it kind of, it was good in that it matched the kind of real world problems that we have, but it, it gave me an appreciation for uh, the challenges around that problem as well. Yeah. And in the real world, no one will tell you whether you're interval is correct right whether you get the full score or not you have yeah. to do experiments yeah 
Oh, and there was also a deployed uh, case. So was anything mm -hmm. different in the deployed case? For me, I, I just changed the inputs a little bit. Um, and, and it was harder, right? There wasn't as clear of a peak for yeah. me. There were more of build search. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was just kind of like a scaled up version of the same same thing to me anyway. Okay. And, and the next problem, problem number three is super spreaders. I'm actually really curious about your, your solution here, Max. <laughs> yeah, so you were given sort of like a graph in time, right? So you had um, several days, and for each day you were given the contacts that were to occur on the day and the probability of spreading the virus. Um, and um, you had to find a person such that if the person is infected on day zero, that would lead to the most um, infected people on, on the given day T. Um, and also, like the scoring was in um, the in median, right? Not on average, but in median. So the simulation was done multiple times, and they would take the median number of infected people at the end. And so you had to provide this person who would get who would um, infect the most other people in median. Um, yeah. So Max, how did you tackle this? Uh, so basically, first, this problem have uh, like <clears throat> this model with median, and also uh, it's this model is kind of discrete because you either ill or not, and you have to make like <clears throat> ninety nine simulations, and that is very slow. So first, what I did is uh, make it a more kind of continuous. So I hold the probability that some person is ill. And uh, then you have to do uh, the simulation only one time. And and this have this small problem that actually you have, uh, in the end, you have the average number instead of median, but they are quite correlated. So if some person is like a super spreader, uh, so it's uh, in terms of median, it's probably uh, the same in terms of average. Yes. And then when I have this better model, I simply test uh, every person to be a super speeder. So it's kind of quadratic solution and also a little bit of uh, parallel programming. And uh, that's all. Yeah. So that, that's, that's what I was curious about. It's, it sounds like you had a brute force kind of solution once you have the model built, right? Yes, yes. And yeah. also one thing, this problem also have a limited number of attempts. Uh, but the thing is uh, that uh, when after I test every person and I if I choose one that have maximum average, I sometimes doesn't have full score. So I maybe sometimes try to take second or third. Uh, to get full score. Yeah, I mean, I, I did a similar thing here. I, I like you reduced it to just the probabilities and just summed up what the, what the total, you know, likely infected was at the end of a, a simulation. But yeah, I could not think of a solution here that wasn't just kind of brute forcing it like that. I had a, had a heuristic approach that allowed me to prune down which ones I actually did the full simulation on. But aside from that, it was still just run the simulation, get a number, and whichever one is the biggest is the one I, I gave to the, the scoreboard. Well, I, I feel it can be pruned very well, but uh, it's like needs like to work on this problem like for a week or something. Yeah. But not in a few hours when you're sleepy. I will say this was my favorite problem, just because it seemed very timely, given uh, the state of the world. Yes, and I also like this problem because pretty much all the problems are like 
your genome, your given genome or something, and you have to do something with these letters or binary strings. And this one is uh, uh, like another type. It's more about like something a real world simulation and not about uh, do something with genome. I do wonder if there's some sort of non brute force solution here. I mean, when internet, tell us if there's a non brute force solution. <laughs> well, I, I always wonder how the, uh, and um, unfortunately this year we don't have anyone from the uh, organizing team or the, um, or the problem authors, but um, you know, it's, it's a big responsibility on the problem authors because, you know, you and I, we can just, you know, submit several attempts and see which one gets the the highest score. But someone on on that end has to actually figure out what the what solution should get the um, the uh, largest the full score. And for for some problems, it's easier. So, for example, for the causal mutation, you actually know what the causal mutation is because you have the raw data from which the um the problem was generated but in this case right in this case they have to well they have more time and more resources so maybe they would be fine with the brute force approach i don't know that would that would be my guess yeah by the way i um i wasn't giving credit to the problem authors so uh let's let's correct this for the problem one, the author was um, Alexei Sergushichev, and the tests were done by Gennady Karotkevich. Uh, for problem two, causative mutation, the author was German Dimidov, and the tests are by Nikolai Budin. And problem three is by Vitaly Aksyonov, and the tests are by Alexandra Trasdova. All right, um, anything else to say about Super spreaders? Don't be one. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, problem number four is minor haplotype, which is by Nikita Alexeyev. The tests are by uh, Daniel Areshnikov. Oh my god, the, um, the problem text is super long here, and I don't remember what it's about. So Matt, can I ask you to to explain the problem? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take a stab at it. So if I remember correctly, th this one was basically um, a situation where, where you get a bunch of sequencing of some sort of viral genome. And the question was, does this sequencing represent one viral population or is there a smaller subpopulation within this one? Basically, ha has our virus mutated in some way is kind of, is kind of the way to think of that. And there were a variety of parameters they gave you, like the sequencing error rate, a minimum number of variants for it to be a new strain, and uh, I think like a, a minimum population level or something like that. And you, you're supposed to try to factor all of that into your problem to say, you know, yes, this is just a single strain, or no, this is a second strain. And I think the second part of that was if there was a second strain, for some of the problems, they wanted you to, to tell tell them what that sequence was, and that was scored on some uh, uh, scale based on how close you were to the true second sequence. So that, that was the the long and short of it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good summary. And uh, how, how did you approach it? Uh, so th this is the one I'm probably least satisfied with overall. So let me start with that, but. The basic way I did this was, was I tried to take the sequences and cluster them into two clusters. Uh, so, you know, you can take all these different sequences and say which ones are most like the other ones and form two cluster strings that you can then look at. And then the second step I would do is say, okay, are these two clusters significantly different based on whatever parameters they gave you for the problem? So if they weren't different, then of course I would say, okay, this is just one viral population, and that was the end of the problem. If they if they were different, um, I just did like a consensus of the viral sequence, the, the second population, and, and submitted that. But the hard part was figuring out whether it's one or two. That was by far the hardest part in my mind. Um, 
And so for me, I actually would take the group of, of sub problems for one of those problems and kind of, I uh, had, had this scoring system that I don't remember how I did it off the top of my head, but uh, I could, I could plot that and get kind of a linear degradation. And there would be one group that was very well clustered. That was probably the ones that were just one viral population. And there was another group that was probably two. And then there were some in the middle where I wasn't exactly sure. Um, and I think part of that's just because I didn't fully factor in all of the sequencing statistics and all these other numbers they gave you for the problem. I think if I, if I had done that, I could probably have gotten a more precise solution overall. So this one was the one I was least satisfied with, but, um, you know, I, I think with more time, I could have done a better job on this one. Cool. And um, Max, what about you? Yeah, so as Matt told, uh, in some cases, you, you may not have minor haplotype, in some tests, you have uh, output only like one or two, which of these two cases. And like think again, four tests where you can get full score without uh, writing anything because you just can try it for, for each test case, one or two, and, uh, <laughs> and that's all. Yes, but uh, actually uh, it's... Uh, the three other test cases where you have to uh, output actual uh, uh, actual minor haplotype first. Uh, one of them have like uh, this important feature that sequencing error is very low. So you have 200 bases and about uh, two bases are uh, errorness, uh, error, and uh, you have uh, the difference between major and minor haplotypes is about uh, 16 bases or more. So if you just compare major haplotype with uh, something that you have in input, if like difference is more than eight, then it's probably minor haplotype, else it's not. So this test case is uh, very easy. Just uh, count the number of difference between two strings. Yes, and for the other two test cases, I again have some troubles in the beginning, and my last approach was like something next. So I wanted to find which bases are different in minor haplotype. So basically, what I did, I brought forth all triplets, and uh, if uh, in all in some triplet, I have uh, the same value of the basis is the same, but different from uh, major haplotype. Probably this uh, base is uh, like uh, is uh, mutated uh, and it's from minor haplotype. So I took after I take all triplets, I have like some statistic. Uh, in how many triplets this base is kind of special and uh, I just put some threshold if uh, it's special in like more than let's say 20 triplets then it's probably uh, from minor haplotype and after that I don't actually remember how I choose haplotypes but it's then easy if you have uh, bases that are mutated I was going to ask Max, what what did you actually code most of your stuff in? C plus plus. Okay. What about you? Yeah, I was, I was using Python, which is handicap in some way because it's slower, but uh, also easier to make things just work sometimes. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, well, basically for me it's opposite. Probably I know that all the people say that it's easier, but probably because I'm like uh, all the time coding C plus plus, it's easier for me and it's. Uh, is the main language in competitive programming. Yeah. How easy or hard is it in C++ or in Python for that matter? I'm also curious uh, to organize parallel computation because in, uh, and I, I think uh, you mentioned, and from, from my own experience, I know that that helps quite a bit if you can parallelize your code easily. So uh, at least in Python, and I, th I think in this competition too, you, you can, if you can, separate your problems into very clean sub-problems, it's very easy to parallelize it. 
uh, which in this contest, a lot of them are just, you know, there might be a hundred sub problems or something. And so it's very easy to run one problem at a time on different processors. Multiple copies of the same script, but different processes. Of the same function. Yeah. You, you can, you can use multi-processing pools and just say, run, you know, this particular function, here's a array of a hundred inputs, go do it a hundred times and it will just kind of take care of all that for you. So that part's a, a little easy. It's just a matter of, can you actually create those sub problems that are kind of distinct from each other and not, you know, sharing the same data structure or something like that. For me, in C++, basically I use Visual Studio and it supports so-called RMP. And basically when I need to parallel something, uh, something that uh, can be easy paralleled, for example, <clears throat> some for loop, uh, I just write like, you can write in C++ pragma on P parallel for num threads and put some number. And that's basically all. So you just write one line and it's parallels the loop. Is it the same as OpenMP? Uh, yes, yes, it's OpenMP, just short. Basically, I just in last semester, uh, I learned it in the university. So we have like parallel programming, so it's like this rare, or at least for, for me, it's this rare uh, situation when you actually use something you learn in university. <laughs> And so the final problem, uh, problem number five, called isoform matching, which is by Andrei Pribilsky, and the tests are by Dmitry Sayutin. There are two versions of this problem, an easy and a hard one. It's an interesting formulation of the problem because uh, they spared us, you know, having to perform the alignment. Um, so they already give us the coordinates which are which, which have been aligned already and so there is the um sort of the reference genome and there are the the coordinates of the um axons and introns actually i i don't remember uh matt can you can you explain the problem here <laughs> sure yeah so it's again they they give you there is a reference genome Right? We don't know what it is, but there is one. And they, they give you the isoforms along that genome in terms of uh, essentially pairs of start and stop for exons. So there'd be, you know, exon one might go from 10 to 20, exon three goes from 40 to 400, and, and there's, a bu there's a bunch in between or whatever. So you have all these isoforms. And then the second thing they give you is a bunch of reads, which are similarly structured in terms of there, there's a start and stop and there's a bunch of them in a row. Uh, I think the first problem was each read has to match the uh, isoform plus or minus some number of bases and you have to figure out uh, which one it matches and if it matches multiple the total count of how many it matches. And then the hard version was just find the isoform that it most closely matches based on some um, some formula. Uh, I think it was like the exon overlap and the intron overlap with some multiplication involved. Um, so yeah, I think th that's the gist of it. And it again, like you said, it matches to the the very well studied you know RNA sequencing problems where you sequence the RNA. It doesn't match your your reference genome because your reference genome has transcripts that start and stop at particular locations. So um, they thankfully skipped that alignment step for us. <laughs> kind of made, made it a little bit easier. Just a little bit. Yeah. So how, how easy was the easy version? The easy version I didn't think was too bad. Um, part of it was I think they didn't quite go, uh, go crazy on the scale yet. Um, the, the hard version, they, they really ramped up the number of transcripts and the length of the genome and the number of, of reads that you had to process. I, I don't remember how many it was, but it was, it was a few hundred thousand, I think, in the largest problem. It, it took a long time to compute. <laughs> uh, but uh, the easy one I don't think was too bad. I, I don't Did you have a different opinion, Max? Uh, well, basically, I don't remember the difference between easy and hard version. 
So basically, my solution is uh, like, like again quadratic because for each uh, query, I just uh, look for the best matching. I compare with uh, every uh, uh, the form we have in the input, and uh, again some some a little one line of open MP and uh, wait for half half a hour or or maybe a little bit more, and uh, that's all. So you you didn't have to modify your solution at all to accommodate the hard problem. I modify the function that combines two either forms because it's different, but the brute force is the same because it's just two loops. Yeah, uh, I had this, I had a similar approach where it was basically brute force with some minor tweaks on whether it's easy or hard. Yeah, I don't know if there's a much better solution there. It was extremely slow in Python, I'll tell you that. It took a lot of parallelizing to get it to finish in time. But I went back to it later just to see how fast I could get it. And you can, I mean, I was using Rust, not C++, but you can get it to run pretty fast, even with this kind of like pseudo brute force approach. I just don't know if there's a better way other than just kind of doing a bunch of comparisons and spitting out the correct one at the end. Yeah, interesting, because for, for me, the hard problem was too hard. Like for my solution that worked pretty well on the easy version, when I tried it on the hard version, it like, I think it either ran out of memory or it was so slow that I could already see it wouldn't finish in time, like no way. So it, it is brute force, as you say, but did you, like how did you optimize it? To, to be performant enough? Did you use some kind of data structures or uh, anything like that? Well, first is C++, and uh, second is uh, the function that, that matches to either forms. It should be like a linear time. So it's, and basically that's all because like, yeah, it's easy to say that uh, you have to parallel everything, but yes, really you have to do some like this non, uh, non asymptotical optimization that uh, make your solution like few uh, several times faster. I, I do think the, uh, the people who put this one together were expecting brute force here, because uh, I, I remember when we were talking to them after the um, competition was over, they they jokingly asked me, "How much compute did you have to use for that one?" <laughs> so I, I think they were expecting uh, some amount of brute forcing of that that last problem. Yes, and I think this problem can be easily make uh, kind of more interesting if you say just don't choose one is a form, but choose like two or several is a form that better describe uh, somehow come up with your own uh, scoring function. So a group of is a forms that describe a new one and uh, that will make problem like choose k of n and it will be impossible to brute force. How would you solve it if it was impossible to brute force? <laughs> well, uh, that's another question. Like, well, if you... Don't tell the competition makers this. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I have idea of one for the problem. Like the full score get uh, like one who gets the more uh, the more points for the test. So it's like, uh, it doesn't matter if your solution bad, if all other people have bad solution. <laughs> and one more thing is that for this problem, I, uh, because at some time I was not sure if uh, it will be enough time, half a hour, or maybe I need five hours. So I uh, ran like, I does, didn't compare uh, each of the form with each other. I like choose uh, like ten percent of all, and uh, <clears throat> of course this doesn't give full score, but it's like in ten percent to the full score. So it's basically uh, if you like not competing for the very first place, it's okay to do some very simple running. It still get high score. All right, so that's all our problems from the final round any concluding thoughts like what are your general impression of the contest yeah i mean I, so i've only uh this was the second finals that i've competed in i'm trying to remember how how 
the first one was I did to see how it, it compares to that one. Um, I liked a lot of, I felt like a lot of the problems were very connected to real issues this time. Um, whether that was, you know, just well-defined problems or like the timely, who's the super spreader problem, th those kind of things felt very, felt very uh, connected to, you know, just th the state of bioinformatics. Um, so I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, overall, you know, I, I enjoy it. Like last, every time I do it, I, I have a lot of fun. Extremely tired by the end of it, but have a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I will say I I have published my solutions if people are interested in looking at that. So those are on my GitHub, and I'm happy to to share that with you somehow. Oh, cool. If, uh, we can put that somewhere. That's very nice of you, and I'll I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode. Sure. Max, do you want to do the same? And publish your solutions. Well, I was scared that uh, people like will watch it and uh, say that I am right some shit code. <laughs> <laughs> scared of C++ more, but <laughs> uh, oh, my code looks terrifying. Like it's you know that that code you write on the twenty third hour of the contest is yeah, that's, absolutely yeah. gross. Don't use it in production, anyone. But it, it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, Max, any, anything from you? Yeah, I also really like contest, especially because I win it. But uh, nonetheless, hard not to like it. Uh, yes. <laughs> And also, I like really thankful to the uh, organizers because uh, <clears throat> I, it may look sometimes like a may, like we make a joke from some problems that you just use binary search and that's all. <laughs> but uh, I was a problem setter a little bit, and I have a lot of friends that are problem setters. And I know how hard it is to come up with problem to make it good for contest, not for just real life or something. And especially when this problem is, uh, or when this problem should be related to the the informatics, it's uh, like uh, much more harder. And uh, they organize this, and uh, in general, it's great. Well, well prepared. Cool. Uh, was this your first contest, or did you take part before? Uh, yes, first be informatic contest. Well, technically, I have experience with kind of similar problems again, uh, because last time I solved a lot of uh, uh, kind of marathons where you have optimizational problem for a week. And uh, so these problems were quite similar to me. I can say that I have experience solving uh, similar problems, but uh, maybe from other fields, maybe one more interesting thing. I, I hope the, I'm not banned for this because actually uh, I was not, I almost was not alone sol solving these problems. I remember like, 1 a.m. Uh, I am solving these problems, and I understand that my laptop is not enough to uh, to, to do all the pro to do all the computations. I need like one more computer, and I like in 1 a.m. I called. I I am now stay at dormitory, and I call to my grandmother and ask her to turn on computer and uh, like. Uh, so I can like connect to it and run computations on this computer. And it was probably the most hard problem because I spent like 30 minutes to explain how to turn on, how to uh, <laughs> input password and how to turn on team viewer and everything. Well, this probably was the, the hardest problem for out of all eight or all nine for me. Yeah. Uh, which um, what problem did you need more compute power for? Uh first I I use parallel programming in first, in fifth, in uh, super spreader. So it in third problem, and uh, in second I used in first. You no, know? so, yeah, in three problems. Yeah, I was gonna say the the fifth one. I think 
you pretty much had to have like a lot of compute to, to just get through that one. Yes. Yeah, I want to echo shout out to the, the organizers because I feel like they do a pretty good job each year putting all this together. And uh, it's always run smoothly for me too. I mean, I know they're using, uh, I think it's Stepic, right, for this, yeah. but yes. it's always very smooth and I, I've never had issues just participating in it. So shout out to them for awesome contest again this year. Thanks, guys, for joining me today. And I hope to see you in the next installments. And I hope to see the next installments of the contest. Thanks for having us. Thanks, you too.